If there were such a thing as a soul in human beings, wouldn't have scientists found it by now? Science seems to have done a good job of explaining why human beings act the way they do in terms of the brain, the nervous system, etc. So why is it even necessary to invoke the idea of the soul in the first place? Well, in this video, I'm going to discuss objections to mind-body dualism, critique these objections, and most importantly, I'm going to explain why it is crucial to believe the soul exists because it is self-defeating to believe otherwise. So I hope you'll stick around and discover why you can't deny you have a soul. All right, welcome. In this lecture, I am going to be talking about the argument from reason. So in the last uh, couple lectures, we looked at arguments against physicalism, uh, gave you reasons to believe that at, uh, at least some kind of dualism is true, whether property or, or mind-body dualism. And then in the second lecture, we looked at arguments specifically for mind-body dualism, showing that property dualism can't be true either. So all we're left with is the uh, distinction between mind and body, uh, and, and we are left with believing that there is a soul. Now, in this lecture, I wanted to talk about objections that you might run into, uh, common objections to mind-body dualism. I wanted to show these objections, then answer these objections, and then finish up this lecture with showing you different versions of the argument for re from reason, which is an argument that shows that it's actually self-defeating to believe that physicalism is true. Uh, so just to top all this off, um, talking about the soul. In our next lectures, we're going to be talking about miracles, and then we're going to get into uh, history and uh, talking about uh, getting into that third step of our, of our um, apologetic method, which is defending the truth of the resurrection. Um, you know, we've talked about the three-step method. It's, it's defending truth. It's defending the existence of God. I threw these lectures in there about the soul just because, like I said, it's important for the gospel. If people don't think there's such thing as a soul, then it's, uh, they're not really going to think that they need a savior, right? Because they won't think that they're going anywhere after they die. So I just like to throw this in there. It's just a little bit more evidence for Christianity and helps us defend the gospel. Um, and then we're going to, like I said, in the next few lectures, we're going to be moving on into that third step. And we're going to start talking about evidence for Jesus' uh, life, uh, death, and resurrection. So we're going to be looking at uh, the New Testament and all sorts of stuff. Now, having said all that, since we're about to move on into that, this is a little bit early because I'm still talking about the soul. But for the Bible verse that I wanted to use for this lecture and the next one uh, on miracles uh, is this verse from John 20, verses 30 through 31, which says, Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples that are not written in this book, but these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. Um, so I don't have too much to say about this verse, except for it basically says that Jesus performed many signs and many miracles, and so many that they uh, didn't even write them all down in the New Testament, uh, which is interesting. Now, um, of course, that next lecture is going to be over the possibility of miracles. So this is why I wanted to use this verse. I'm using it for this in the next lecture. One interesting thing, uh, if you're watching this on a video, I have a chart here that shows uh, Jesus' messianic claims. Uh, if you are familiar with the book of John, uh John is famous for uh, uh, describing Jesus making these seven I am statements. So Jesus says that, uh, he says, I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. I am the gate for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I am the resurrection and the life. I am the way, the truth, and the life, and I am the true vine. Well, another thing that you may or may not know about John is that he also records Jesus performing several uh, really important miracles. And uh, it seems like uh, the way uh, John wrote his gospel, he wanted us to connect Jesus 
uh, I am statements with his uh, with Jesus miraculous signs. And if you notice here, so I, I have these in the order that they show up in John's gospel. Uh, but the, the miraculous signs that Jesus performed include uh, turning water into wine, uh, healing a royal official son, healing a disabled man, feeding 5,000 people, walking on water, healing a man born blind, and raising Lazarus from the dead. So that's in the order that they showed up. But if you'll notice, some of these miracles... Uh, maybe not every single one of these, but a lot of these uh, I am statements line up with these uh, mirror, these signs that Jesus performed. So, you know, for example, he says he is the bread of life and he fed 5,000 people. He says he's the light of the world uh, and he healed a blind man. Uh, he says uh, he is the resurrection and the life and he rose uh, Lazarus from the dead. He says he is the true vine, and he turned water into wine. So I, I just thought this was interesting. It comes from John, who says that Jesus performed many miracles. And one thing it kind of shows us is that, uh, and this is going to be really important when we get to that lecture, is that miracles aren't just God flexing his muscles and showing us that he can do things. Usually they have a purpose, and usually a miracle is to confirm uh, or or to... Uh, demonstrate that God is trying to speak to us for a reason okay so uh, so we'll be looking at that passage again when we get to that next lecture for now let's go ahead and ask a couple questions for reflection the first one is which statement do you think is better random genetic variations and natural selection give rise to organisms with true beliefs or Random genetic variations and natural selection give rise to organisms with beliefs that help them survive. As, and why do you think which one is better than over the other? So we're asking, uh, which makes more sense? That random uh, genetic variations and natural selection would give rise to organisms with true beliefs, or would it just give rise to organisms with beliefs that help them survive? Uh, we'll be discussing that, obviously, in this lecture. Uh, our next question, our last question for reflection is, uh, materialism entails that all things are caused by the physical laws of nature. But if all of your mental activity is determined by the laws of nature, are your conclusions rational? Why or why not? So you can, if, if you're following on the video, maybe you can uh, answer those questions and, or just ask questions uh, to me in the comment section. Or you can send me an email uh, if you're just listening to this on podcast, I'd love to hear from you guys. So, but let's 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 get into this. So, like I said, first we're going to be looking at objections to substance dualism. I was going to look at three main objections to substance dualism. As I'm talking about them, I'm going to give the answer to these, and then we're going to move into a couple uh, a couple examples of the argument from reason. So, uh, the three examples, the three objections we're going to look at are the problem of physical causal closure, the argument from neuroscience, and the past scientific success argument, okay? So the first one is the problem of physical causal closure. And as it says here, this is an argument stating that physical events only have physical causes and invoking immaterial mental causation is both unnecessary and overdetermines actions. So, uh, yes, this is a, an, our, an objection to substance dualism that has appeared in the literature on the philosophy of mind. Um, it, and it basically, so, it, you know, the name explains it all. It's saying that the causal, um, the causal loop has been closed, basically. The objector to substance dualism says that scientists have explained uh, human actions in terms of, in physical terms. So to invoke a, 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 an immaterial soul or mind in all this uh, is to do two things. One is to overdetermine actions. It's to give a second explanation for something that's already been explained. Uh, and so it is unnecessary. It's not needed and it's overdetermining actions. Um, one of my favorite quotes, and this is a really long quote, but I just think it really sums up the whole thing. Is from a philosopher of mine named Jaguan, uh, Jaguan Kim, uh, who actually passed away recently. But uh, he makes this statement, which just basically 
Uh, this is in his book, Philosophy of Mind, uh, from ni- 1998. But he makes this statement that basically sums it all up. So he says, You want to raise your arm and your arm goes up. Presumably, nerve impulses reaching appropriate muscles in your arm made those muscles contract, and that's how the arm went up. And these nerve signals presumably originated in the activation of certain neurons in your brain. What caused these neurons to fire? We now have a quite detailed understanding of the process that leads to the firing of a neuron in terms of complex electrochemical processes involving ions in the fluid inside and outside a neuron. Differences in voltage across cell membranes and so forth. All in all, we seem to have a pretty good picture of physics, chemistry, and biology. If the immaterial mind is going to cause a neuron to emit a signal or prevent it from doing so, it must somehow intervene in these electrochemical processes. Surely the working neuroscientist does not believe that to have a complete understanding of these complex processes, she needs to include in her account the workings of immaterial souls and how they influence the molecular processes involved. So, as you can see, Kim is saying that science has explained uh, how the body works in terms of neurons firing and all the chemistry and and physics that involves you, you know, uh, raising your arm if you want to raise your arm and all that. And and invoking an immaterial mind and all that is going to have to, there's going to be a need, first there's going to need to be a need for invoking that, and second it's going to need to actually explain something. But like he says, they seem to think that they've explained it all completely in physical terms. So, uh, like the problem of physical causal closure emphasizes, to invoke an immaterial mind would be unnecessary, and it would to be it would bring up uh, it would overdetermine the action. You know, if I, uh, you know, to give you an example, uh, another example, if I if I said, you know, say say I have an employee and, and uh, he or she is late to work, and I and I say. Why were you late to work this morning? What's wrong? What, you know, is something wrong? And he or she said, well, my car broke down. And I said, okay, well, uh, why else were you late to work? You know, um, my employee is going to look at me like I'm crazy because they've already given me the explanation for why they were late. So why am I looking for a second explanation? Well, that's what the uh, objector to substance dualism is saying here. Um, they've already explained it in physical terms. So why are we looking for an explanation? Now, how would the mind-body dualist answer this? Now, I'm saying all of these objections in the context of us already having given all these arguments against physicalism and for mind-body dualism, okay? So I, I, I want to emphasize this as we go along. The, um, <clears throat> so the, the first thing that is a problematic with this problem of physical causal closure, okay, is and really the most damaging thing is that it just it basically uses circular reasoning. You know, and if you're familiar with circular reasoning, it is definitely a no no in logic. You don't want to be using circular reasoning. And circular reasoning is when you have uh, an argument in which the conclusion is already is already contained in the premises somewhere. So basically, you're assuming the conclusion before you reach the conclusion, but you use the conclusion as evidence for the conclusion. Does that make sense? And it's called circular reasoning because you've already assumed what you wanted to conclude is true. A famous example that people use against Christians all the time is is pointing out that Christians believe the Bible is true because the Bible says the Bible is true. You know, it'd be like assuming that the Bible is the Word of God, so whenever the Bible says that it's the Word of God, then you conclude that it's the Word of God, right? And and, and that's an example of circular reasoning. Uh, well, anyways, uh, that's what this problem of physical causal closure is doing. If you notice, um, uh, it's basically saying that all human actions only have physical causes, so therefore substance dualism is false. But th- this is circular reasoning because it's assuming that all f- all human actions have only physical causes. It's all closed. So they're saying, well, we don't need to look any further. But um, as we saw in our first two lectures on the soul, uh, this is actually ignoring uh, many things about human actions and the human experience. We saw that, for example, uh, we experience the world as persons. Uh, there's an I in there somewhere. 
So there's first person facts about human beings that can't be explained in physical terms. And we also saw that human actions have uh, rational reasons and human actions have intentionality and aboutness about uh, about them that uh, can't be explained in physical terms. So uh, the mind-body dualist is ignoring our first personal perspective on the world and ignoring human intentionality and reason and then just assuming that everything is explained in physical terms. If you remember, you know, we were talking about Socrates being late to meeting Plato in the market. Why was Socrates late? Is it a good explanation to say that light was hitting him in the eyeballs? Or, or, or sound waves were hitting him in the ears. No, that wasn't the explanation for why he was late because the explanation was because he wanted to listen to the lecture a little bit more before he went down to the market. That was the rational reason for why he was late. And the physical explanation wouldn't give you the whole story. So there, there you have it. If, an, uh, if, a, um, uh, if a physicalist is using this problem of physical causal closure argument, he or she is just assuming that all, uh, explanation, all human actions have only physical explanations. And, and if they're, he or she is trying to make this argument, it's basically circular reasoning. Okay. Uh, uh, next, uh, the next major objection that I mentioned uh, against substance dualism is the argument from neuroscience, okay? And, of course, uh, you know, we don't, I don't want to downplay neuroscience whatsoever. Uh, neuroscience has taught uh, humanity, you know, we have learned so much through neuroscience, let's say, about the brain and, and everything that goes into human actions and how to cure diseases and all sorts of things. So neuroscience is obviously a great thing. But if someone tries to say that neuroscience has, has not, you know, neuroscientists have never found any evidence for a soul, therefore it does not exist, then there's going to be problems with this, okay? And that's basically what uh, my slide says here. The argument from neuroscience is an argument stating that neuroscientists have found no evidence of the soul, therefore it does not exist. But there's a couple problems with this objection. So uh, first, now, yeah, so first, if this objection is saying that neuroscientists don't feel the need to invoke immaterial causes for our actions, uh, then, you know, basically you can just talk about uh, it's using circular reasoning, just like the physical causal closure argument, okay? Uh, but it might not, that might not always be the case. Uh, a lot of times, and I think I might have even heard this before personally uh, when talking to people, uh, people will just say that, well, how come neuroscientists haven't found evidence of the soul, right? Uh, scientists haven't found the soul, so it must not exist. But here's, here's the problem with this one, right? Um, the problem is that science, by its very nature, okay, is the search for physical explanations for physical phenomena, right? So science isn't looking for an immaterial soul. And even if there was some kind of... Uh, some kind of missing link in, in human actions from the brain to the arm, say, when you, when you raise your, your hand, they're not going to look for an ex immaterial explanation. They're going to look for some other explanation. It, it, uh, it's very well known. It's something called methodical naturalism. That will, If I haven't already talked about it, I will eventually when we uh, go through, especially towards the end of our series uh, but methodical naturalism, scientists look for natural explanations for natural phenomena, okay? So it's really strange for someone to say that the soul doesn't exist because neuroscientists haven't found one. Uh, to kind of show how weird and, and off that, that statement would be, it would be like saying, uh, well, okay, so... I wanted to see if there was any rubber in this field, so I got out my best metal detector, and I combed this entire field, and I didn't find any rubber, so therefore there is no rubber in this field because my metal detector didn't detect it. Right? Uh, you're... You <laughs> And, you know, again, I'm not a scientist, but I'm pretty sure that a metal detector wouldn't detect rubber because rubber is not a metal, right? You're using the wrong tool to look for, uh, to look for rubber if you're trying to use a metal detector. And that's basically uh, 
uh, what is happening if you are saying that scientists haven't found an immaterial soul. Well, guess what? Scientists aren't looking for an immaterial soul. Uh, they're not. They're not looking for it in the first place, so they're never going to find it. Okay. Now, another thing about this argument from neuroscience, from neuroscience, is that actually, when you think about it, it's irrelevant. Okay. Um, because neuroscience. Another thing about neuroscience is that it is mainly um, uh, concerned with causation, right? Like it's conserved. It's concerned with. Uh, uh, it revolves around the relations of causation or constant connection uh, between the brain and the body. It's looking for what's causing what. But if you remember, all of our arguments for the soul mainly revolved around the question of identity. Okay? Because there's all sorts of things with causation that can happen that don't really have anything to do with questions of identity. Uh, you know, it's it's possible that brain events do cause mind events. So, for example, um, you know, it's possible that my neurons firing in my brain centers, uh, or excuse me, my neuron, uh, my neurons firing in the pain centers of my brain, or what caused my sensation of pain, right? Or or willing to raise my arm might cause my arm to move upward. Uh, so it's possible that every time I do will something or experience something, uh, something happens in my body. Or every time my brain fires neurons, I experience something in my mind. Okay, But these correlations aren't enough to show identity. Just because something always causes another thing or if, or if one thing is always correlated with another thing doesn't mean that the two are identical. Pepper, for example, uh, say you have pepper in the air, uh, that might always cause you to sneeze, but that doesn't mean that pepper and sneezing are identical. Or like an example I used earlier, uh, uh, something can't be trilateral without being triangular, but this correlation doesn't mean that triangularity and being trilateral are the same thing. So uh, anyways, what neuroscience is looking at is it's studying the causation and the connections in the human body. And just because every time I think something, there's some uh, correlation or something happening, some neurons firing in a certain portion of my brain, that they very well might be causing one another. But that's doesn't really that's not enough to establish identity. Okay, and that's what our our arguments were mainly about. Uh, so really, this argument from neuroscience is irrelevant because it's not asking questions of metaphysical identity. Our philosophical arguments are okay now the next objection before we move on to show you the arguments from reason is an objection to mind-body dualism called the past scientific success argument this is the argument stating that physical explanations have usually replaced false immaterial explanations and therefore it is very likely that there are no immaterial things um, you can argue, uh, someone could object in various ways using uh, various things throughout the history of science. You know, so if you study the history of science, the history of Western thought, you'll see there's all these examples where uh, certain uh, people were trying to explain certain phenomena happening in the world, and they started off using immaterial explanations, and then later on uh, it was found or believed uh, that these phenomena were explained in, in physical terms only. And what the uh, objector to substance dualism here does using past scientific success argument is says that just like so many things before that were thought to be uh, getting caused by immaterial causes, those, those things were explained with fully physical explanations so also the mind, uh, the question of the, the immaterial of the mind um, is probably going to be yet another thing that will be explained in completely physical terms. Uh, you know, and people can point out uh, several things like magnetism, for example, uh, was is something that at one time people thought that these uh, spirits uh, uh, were in rocks or, or things like that. And that is why the, the rocks were moving, but that was later... Uh, you know, obviously explained in terms of the electromagnetic force. There's so many examples that we could bring up. Planetary motion, you know, back in uh, the days of Aristotelian cosmology, 
in, in earlier cosmologies, they thought that the the uh, the Earth was at the center of the uh, of the solar system. For example, I mean, they didn't even think in terms of solar systems. Really, they thought this the Earth was the center of the universe, and surrounding the Earth were these uh, six or seven. Uh, uh, basically layers um six or seven spheres and you know and and a lot of it had to do with the planets and they thought that all the crud came to the middle the the worst uh, ways of existing all of that stuff settled in the center and the further you got out from the earth the more perfect the existence was well anyways you know people like aristotle aristotle are argued that there's this unmoved mover uh, possibly he thought there was more than one, but he thought the unmoved mover was the cause of the movement of the planets and uh, many other examples in other cosmologies. And now they would explain planetary motion in terms of curvature in space time and uh, through the gravitational force and all that. And I could go on and on. Uh, life used to be now, life is uh, on my list here. I've got life and mental illness of the last two. Life, I think, is one of the more controversial on the list. I think if you get into metaphysics, some people think that explaining life in completely physical terms is not something you can do. But some people have said that, you know, back in, like, say, Aristotle's day, where he said that plants have vegetative souls and uh, animals have sensitive souls, human beings have rational souls. But the soul was the form of the the organism, and the soul was the principle of life in the organism. But this the the soul was thought to be the form of the thing, and the form is immaterial. So, anyways, uh, that was thought to be in part explained immaterially, and now uh, some people argue that it's life is explained completely in physical terms, uh, in terms of you know uh, cell, cellular processes and and uh, reproduction and all that. Uh, mental illness is is another on our list. Um, I'm going to talk about a distinction between mental illness and uh, demon possession later on in this course. But uh, you know, a lot of people think that ancient peoples were just trying to explain what they were seeing, so they said that people were uh, possessed by demons. But now um, they think that these demons are the immaterial explanation that has been overturned uh, overturned by explaining mental illness through uh, brain abnormalities. So just like all of these things have been overturned with physical explanations, the objector says so also the mind uh, will be uh, fully explained in, in physical terms in the future. Now let's talk about how you would answer this objection, okay? Now uh, again, this is all uh, talking about these objections is all done in the context of all of the arguments that we've looked at before. So if you if if you start talking to someone and you haven't explained some of these arguments for the soul, and they bring up some of these objections, don't say, you know, don't turn to them and say you're ignoring all the evidence for the soul. Because if you haven't presented the evidence to them, you know, you can't say you're ignoring the evidence, right? Because they might not even know about it. Uh, but but if this was all someone had to go off of and they had heard these other arguments for the soul and against physicalism, then yes, uh, this argument would just be ignoring all that. Because again, we're not necessarily worried about how things are explained as much as we're worried about this question of identity, and we gave plenty of evidence to show that in principle there is a distinction to be made between the, our mental lives and, and our, our physical bodies, right? And, and because in principle, using philosophical, like metaphysical concepts uh, and, and sound reasoning, we are showing that the mind and the body are not identical, okay? In principle... And because that has been established, you know, it doesn't matter uh, how more advanced in technology we get or how much more we learn in science. Uh, what we're saying is that there's, there's, it's, it's reasonable. It's, uh, it, you know, it, philosophically, it makes sense that they are identical. So thinking that there's going to be some new physical discovery isn't going to change that fact. So actually, this is almost like a, uh, you know, like a, have you ever heard of someone call, uh, 
So like it, uh, when Christians say that God exists, someone will say, well, that's a God of the gaps fallacy. You know, there's something about the universe that we don't understand. So you're just saying that God caused it. Um, this is kind of like that, but the opposite. This is, uh, this is an example of a, uh, of a physicalist uh, having faith in science uh, when it's, it's, you know, it's just trying to explain something. So, well, science has explained it before, so science will explain it again. Um, you know, and it's like, well, you just don't understand what I'm talking about with these philosophical concepts. So you're just saying, well, I don't understand it, so science will fix it, you know. <laughs> so it's, it's almost an example of uh, the physicalist having faith in something apart from the, the, what we're trying to show is, is obviously true, that the mind and the body are, are distinct. So anyways, just it, honestly, I think it's just best to just point out that uh, this scientific success argument is, is just sidestepping the whole issue and it's ignoring evidence uh, that we've shown that the mind and the body are not identical, okay? So anyways, uh, that's just a way you, you could tackle some of these major objections. Let's, let's move on. Uh, the last thing that we're going to show here are two arguments, uh, what we call arguments from reason, okay? You know, my slide says these are arguments that show it is irrational to believe physicalism and property dualism are true. And I group them together uh, and call them arguments from reason. But really, the first one is called the argument from reason. The second one is called the evolutionary argument from naturalism. And uh, what I was going to do is explain how these arguments work and, and show you how they uh, basically show that it is self-defeating to believe that you don't have a soul. Okay, so the first one is called the argument from reason, like I said. Um, and I've, I really enjoy this argument. You know, not to, uh, not to be too crass, but I... I I just, I really think that this pulls out one of the ironies of, of the atheistic movement where, you know, kind of what we call atheistic evangelists who try to go out into the world and, and, and convince everybody that God doesn't exist. But a lot of times uh, these kind of people call themselves free thinkers, okay? And, and, you know, obviously it's more of a statement about how you know, uh, it's basically saying that if you are a religious believer, you're basically going along with the crowd. It's more of you're believing it because it's a tradition more than it's true. And free thinkers are people who think for themselves and, and, and come to these rational conclusions that religion is false. Well, one of the ironies of all this, and you'll see this in this argument from reason, is that uh, if if physicalism is true, then it's actually impossible for anybody to be rational. So if physicalism is true, if atheism is true, um, then uh, there's no such thing as a free thinker. Uh, so anyways, uh, let, let's, let's talk about this argument from reason. This argument from reason actually is, is, is made famous uh, and was pointed out by C.S. Lewis in his book, Miracle. So if you haven't already read that, I, I, I highly recommend it. Um, and this is a, a basic way that you can formulate what he said in there. Okay, so we've, uh, another simple one. We've got two premises and a conclusion. Premise one says, if physicalism is true, then none of my conclusions are reached by a rational process. Two, premise two, my conclusions are reached by a rational process. Three, therefore, physicalism is false. So let's talk about how we uh, let's talk about what we're getting at and and how to defend this. Okay, so premise one says if physicalism is true, then none of my conclusions are reached by a rational process. So um, this is uh, and this is one of my favorite parts of it. So it just really points out something that I think a lot of us take for granted, which is what is reason in the first place? What is rationality? If you're not, if you don't have training in philosophy, a lot of times you just don't think about what logic is and what it entails, right? So basically, let's think about this. If physicalism is true, that means that you don't have a soul, right? Whether it's property dualism or physicalism, if, if that is true, then you don't have a soul. But here's the problem with that. If you don't have a soul, then everything about you is physical, 
But we live in a world where everything that is physical is controlled by the laws of nature, right? So if everything about you is physical, then so also everything about you is controlled by the laws of nature. And what C.S. Lewis points out is that if everything about you is controlled by the laws of nature, then the explanation for your actions, the explanation for all of your actions, is a physical explanation, not a rational explanation. Does that make sense? So, uh, now, and, and this isn't just, we're not just talking about uh, uh, Socrates' decision to stay in the amphitheater instead of coming down to the market. What we're doing is we're turning this concept into the very argument that physicalism is true in the first place. So if everything about you is controlled by the laws of nature, that includes your cognitive uh, uh, processes, right? And here, and here's the kicker. Rationality presupposes that you, it presupposes two things. One uh, that you have a choice bet- between believing whether something is true or false, rational or irrational, based on the evidence and the logic that you use, right? Rationality involves, uh, and if, if you take in a logic class, you'll, you'll, you'll be taught this. When you evaluate a logical argument, first you evaluate the logic of the argument, and then second you evaluate the truth of the premises. What's, what's uh, assumed in this whole process is that, one, you understand logical concepts and relations, and two, that you can look at evidence and determine whether it is true or false. And then you have a choice where you look at all this and weigh it all. You determine based on the rules whether it's logical or not, and you determine based on the evidence. You make a choice whether it's true or not. But if everything about you is controlled by the laws of nature, then even your conclusions about uh, any type of evidence or your conclusions about whether something is logical, these themselves have physical explanations, not rational explanations, okay? Another concept that is involved in all this is that rationality presupposes that you understand the meaning of the concepts, kind of like what I just said. Uh, where you would where you would try to under you would try to determine whether something is true or false or not okay and I get this concept from a Catholic philosopher named Edward Fazer in his book called the last superstition okay he's trying to get at the uh, thinking about okay if we're completely physical then our 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 thoughts are really just kind of things that flow through us our thoughts aren't really things that we know as much as they're just they're just almost like ones and zeros passing through a computer, right? And uh, he makes this point that machines don't really understand what they're doing, even if it involves information. They're just pushing everything along. And and let me let me read this long quote he has from the last superstition. He says, "With a calculator." One symbol or set of symbols generates another entirely by virtue of the physical properties of the symbols. The meaning of the symbols plays no role whatsoever. Hence, 2 plus 2 and equals generate 4, simply because the machine has been designed in such a way that the electrical impulses associated with the first set of symbols cause an impulse associated with the the latter symbol, so that a four appears on the screen. The former symbols would generate this latter one whatever meaning we assign to them, or even if they had no meaning at all. The point he's getting at is that you could design a calculator that would give you the most absurd uh, responses. It doesn't matter whether what it's saying is true, it's just giving you the symbols that it's it's made to do and this is all explained uh, in terms of the electrical impulses right you hit the button and it says two on the screen that's not because uh or, or let's say this you hit two plus two and then you hit equals the calculator's not giving you four as an answer because that's the truth the calculator is giving you four as the answer because that's what it's designed to do and it all is explainable in terms of electrical impulses. 
But if the calculator was programmed to say something else, like 2 plus 2 equals Chicago, it would just do that because that's just what the electrical impulses cause. And it could be even more absurd, like, um, you know, like Dallas plus Austin equals Houston. And, and it just wouldn't make any sense, but the calculator is just going to do what it's made to do, regardless of whether it's true, regardless of whether it even means anything. And the point of all this is to, is to bring it back to this uh, argument from reason when we're saying if physicalism is true, then none of my conclusions are reached by a rational process. The problem is, if I am just a flesh robot, if I'm just a, a machine that has uh, uh, physical, you know, uh, neurons firing in my head and maybe that has mental properties maybe it doesn't but if i'm just a flesh robot then all this stuff passing through my head is passing through me just like ones and zeros in a computer or just like the electrical impulses through a calculator and the things i say and believe aren't guaranteed to be true they're just happening because because of the physical processes involved not because they are true or not because of any rational process, okay? So to believe that physicalism is true is to believe, like I said, that everything about you is completely physical and everything about you is caused by, uh, is, is controlled by the laws of nature. So um, that means that your choices, your actions have no rational explanation. They just have nothing but a physical explanation, okay? And why is that problematic? That's because we believe that our conclusions are reached by a rational process, right? That's, that's why I find it so amusing uh, to a certain extent that atheists go out trying to explain to everybody that atheism is true. There, or, or let's say physicalist, because uh, you can be an atheist and still be a naturalist and still believe in souls. But anyways, physicalist, a lot of times atheists are physicalists. But let's say a physicalist is trying to, is trying to argue to me that God doesn't exist and neither does the soul. Well, guess what? That's self-defeating. Because like I said, if premise one is true, that if, if you, uh, physicalism is true, then you um, then your conclusions are not reached by a rational process, uh, then that means that the very conclusion that physicalism is true is self-defeating. Because if physicalism is true, then you uh, then your conclusion that you reach that it is true is not based on a rational process process is based on a physical process so then the very rationality of the whole process is all done away with and your conclusion is irrational at this point right it's hard to deny premise one if physical is true then none of my conclusions are reached by a rational process i, I just don't see your way around it and you, and you definitely don't want to uh you definitely don't want to object to premise two right my conclusions are reached by a rational process i I hope you don't run into somebody who denies that because to deny it is it's self-defeating, right? And if someone doesn't think that their conclusions are reached by a rational process, then there's no reason to argue with them. You can just move on. Um, but, but yeah, there you have it. So your conclusion is therefore physicalism is false. Uh, now, I mean, in, in, in professional philosophy and these, these lectures are made for more of a beginner audience, right? I will say that there are all these theories in uh, philosophy. So if you get into the whole debate over free will and determinism and whether physicalism, how physicalism is evolved in that, there are, there are a lot of uh, physicalists who do believe in free will in a certain sense. It's a, it's a view of free will called compatibilism, where they think even though you are determined in a certain way, that still... There's still a way that you to say you have freedom, but but really this this argument is not about free will. It's about rationality, and I just don't. I just think it's fair to say that if everything about you is explained physically, in, including your conclusions and your actions, then that does away with rationality itself because rationality presupposes that you can understand things. And that you have a choice when you weigh the evidence and that you, you make your decisions based on a rational process, not a physical process. So there's the argument from reason saying that it is self-defeating to believe that physicalism is true. Because if you do, uh, you are basically uh, doing away with the very possibility of rationality itself. Okay, 
Now, another interesting argument that I wanted to bring up that I kind of put in this family of arguments from reason is, is what's called the evolutionary argument from naturalism. Uh, this argument is going to make a similar point that we make uh, we made in the last uh, lecture, and it, and it's another uh, one that I've got a simple uh, a simple formulation here. So it says, if physicalism is true, we cannot trust our cognitive faculties because they are not designed to know the world. Two, our cognitive faculties are basically trustworthy. Three, therefore, physicalism is false. So let's get into how you would defend this one really quickly, and then we'll be done with this lecture. We can move into our lecture on uh, the possibility of miracles. Uh, but what when you're defending premise one, so if you remember, premise one says, if physicalism is, if physicalism is true, we cannot trust our cognitive faculties because they are not designed to know the world. I actually already talked about something really similar to this in the last lecture. If you remember, you know, we're, when you were asking if physicalism is true, um, if physicalism is true, then God doesn't exist, souls don't exist, right? All life on earth, if it's even possible to arise in a atheistic world, in a physicalist universe, it would be the product of evolution and evolution alone, right? Evolutionary theory says that... <clears throat> The organisms that are alive today are alive because they have traits that are conducive for survival, right? And all this is uh, is determined in part by natural selection. But here's the kicker that you, and here's what happens. So you emphasize what evolutionary theory is saying is that all of the traits of an animal, or most of them anyways, are there because their traits are conducive to survival, well, this is also going to apply to their beliefs. If you remember when we talked uh, in the lecture over um, ethics, I discussed how um, they, they say oftentimes, it was in the lecture over uh, the moral argument, um, atheists will say that uh, your, your moral beliefs are just a herd mentality that they're just a product of natural selection, a herd mentality that human beings evolved over the years to survive. Um, well, th this is a similar concept, okay? Now, take your, let's say that you believe that evolutionary theory is true, okay? Here's the problem with that. If phys I mean, you know, you can believe in a soul, I'm, if, if you believe evolution is true, I'm not saying that you are necessarily an atheist. Don't ever take me to be saying that. But if, if physicalism is true, right, and everything about us is the product of natural selection, that's going to include even our beliefs. But um, just like any other trait, our beliefs aren't supposed to be uh, necessarily true. They're just conducive to survival, right? And I mentioned earlier in the in the lecture over the moral argument. Let's say I believe I have a belief that mo there's a bunch of monsters in the forest near my house, and maybe that helps me survive because maybe you know I could get lost in there, I might fall in a pit, or maybe there really are some dangerous animals. But people who go in there might die, but I'm going to stay alive because I have this false belief that there's monsters in the forest. Well, natural selection is going to favor me because I have this trait that's conducive to survival. There's nothing, of, there's, and that doesn't just go for my belief about monsters in the forest. It goes for all my beliefs. They don't have to be true. They just have to be conducive for survival. Okay? So, if physicalism is true and, and uh, natural selection and everything about us is, is, is explainable through natural selection and, all, and, and, and survivability and flourishing and all that, it, it really proves too much, right? Because um, if it, it's not just our, you know, like we mentioned in the moral argument lecture, it wouldn't just be our moral beliefs that are a product of evolution. It would be all of our beliefs that are a product of evolution. So if we, can, if we have reason to doubt our moral beliefs because they're a product of evolution, so also we have reason to doubt every single other belief that we hold, right? 
it's not just my beliefs about what is right and wrong. It could also be my beliefs about there's monsters in the forest. Um, any other belief I have about the world, even my belief that physicalism is true or my belief that evolutionary theory is true. Maybe those aren't even true. They're just conducive to survival. Anything you believe is going to be a, a just some thing that supposedly is mainly meant, or not necessarily meant, but mainly is conducive to survival. It's not guaranteed to actually be true. So uh, this, so a belief in physicalism and natural selection, uh, uh, those two things together come together to actually form this this uh, skepticism. Really, if you can't you can't trust your moral beliefs, you can't, but you also can't trust any other belief you have. J.P. Moreland in his book on the soul actually goes even further and says it wouldn't just be your thoughts about the world and your beliefs about the world. This would also include your include your perceptions of the world. Right. And he says something like it's possible that red things in reality are actually blue or big things are actually small. Uh, so we have these strange perceptions of the world that aren't actually the way the world really is, but they help us survive somehow. Um, one way I think of this, maybe an easier way to explain it is just maybe whenever I go out to the forest, it smells terrible to me. This, the, for, the forest smells really stinky. So I stay away from it and I survive. But in reality, maybe the forest doesn't stink at all. Maybe it actually smells pretty good. But that, that, uh, but that perception, that false perception I have that the forest is stinky keeps me away from it and keeps me alive. And just like that, any other perception of the world, it's possible that it's false, but it's keeping us alive. So again, this belief in, in physicalism and evolutionary theory alone would come together to make it so that you couldn't trust really any of your, uh, any belief you have about the world or even any of your perceptions of the world. So then you get to premise two. Premise two says our cognitive faculties are basically trustworthy. And I don't want to go as far as to say that this is necessarily self-defeating, but if someone objects and says our cognitive faculties aren't basically trustworthy, well, they're either, you know, it is kind of self-defeating to say that your cognitive faculties aren't trustworthy because that's a conclusion that basically defeats itself, right? Or at the very least, it's self-undermining. <laughs> You're saying, well, I'm not sure because my uh, cognitive faculties aren't basically trustworthy. So hopefully you're not going to find too many people who are going to object to premise two, right? It'd be silly to do so. Um, to do so is to basically also make the statement that you believe that your faculties are trustworthy because you're making a conclusion. So then we get to our conclusion. Therefore, physicalism is false, right? And just to reemphasize, it is self-defeating to believe that your cognitive faculties evolved from blind, random, natural processes. And to embrace the physicalism and the truth of evolutionary theory is to embrace a global skepticism which knowledge is not possible or very doubtable. Because it is possible that your very perceptions, uh, your very beliefs about the world aren't true. They just help you survive. Therefore, physicalism and property dualism are false because, uh, like we said, it would be self-defeating to believe in them. Just like we said with the argument from reason, so also this evolutionary argument from naturalism uh, shows that it's also self-defeating to believe uh, in that way. So I hope you enjoyed this lecture on the arguments from reason as much as I did. Let's quickly review our questions for reflection. We'll close out this lecture. So if you remember, uh, our first question was, which statement do you think is better? Random genetic variations and natural selection give rise to organisms with true beliefs or random genetic variations and natural selection give rise to organisms with beliefs that help them survive. Why or why not? Or, why, or which one? Materialism entails, uh, our second question is, materialism entails that all things are caused by the physical laws of nature, but if all of your mental activity is determined by the laws of nature, are your conclusions rational? Why or why not? And uh, I, we're going we're gonna to start ending with a, a different quote over the next few lectures. I'm going to leave you with a quote from Frank Turek. Uh, he's a doctor of ministry from Southern Evangelical Seminary. He wrote a book called Stealing from God, Why Atheists Need God to Make Their Case. He says, if there is a God who created the universe, then he can do whatever he wants that's not logically impossible inside the universe. 
Uh, that's actually a quote that we're going to be using as we talk about the possibility of miracles. So uh, really quickly, I just wanted to um, talk about Southern Evangelical Seminary. Um, as I explained at the end of all of these lectures, Southern Evangelical Seminary is where I got my Ph.D. in philosophy of religion. It is a, a great place to go if you're looking to learn more about apologetics, philosophy, uh, theology, the Bible, the biblical languages, all that stuff. They have any uh, things as as small as, as certificates to bachelor's degrees to master's degrees, all the way to a Ph.D. or a doctor of ministry. Um, it's, they have online programs that are extremely uh, well put together and accessible. They also have face-to-face -face programs there in, in uh, near Charlotte, uh, North Carolina. So I highly recommend S uh, Southern Evangelical Seminary. If you would like a free resource from them, you can go to ses.edu, hover over the media button, and then click on the Why Trust the God of the Bible link. It will take you to a free PDF book. It's about 50 pages long, so it's a great free resource. It goes over all the evidence for Christianity, for God's existence, Jesus' resurrection, and how we can trust the Bible. Um, and, so the, and so that's a great free resource for you if you are interested in that. I would also like to mention that uh, Kingdom Preparatory Academy is the place where I originally taught this material for the first time. Um, it is Kingdom Preparatory Academy is a classical Christian school here in Lubbock, Texas. It's where my kids go. I wouldn't want to send them anywhere else. If you are interested in a classical Christian alternative to education, I recommend Kingdom Preparatory Academy. It is a pre-K through 12 uh, classical school. Like I said, it's Christian classical. They teach your kids how to think, not what to think. And it's a university model, so your kids actually only go to school from Monday, Wednesday, to th uh, on, on Mondays, Wednesdays, and Thursdays, usually in most grades. Um, uh, it's actually optional. They can go on Monday and Wednesday and then stay home on Friday, or they can go, they can go on Fridays as well. Uh, but it's a fantastic school. Uh, actually, going uh, on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday uh, makes it cheaper than other schools where they go to school all week. Um, but uh, regardless of that, it is Christ-centered. It is, it is rigorous with its academics, and it's a classical model. I highly recommend it. If you are interested in that, go to kingdomprep.org and, and check that out. Uh, in our next lecture, we are going to be discussing the uh, possibility of miracles. So we're going to be looking at arguments for and against the possibility of miracles uh, to set up moving into the third step of apologetics, well, which will be defending the truth of Jesus' resurrection. So I, I hope you will be there, and I look forward to discussing it.